Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Harv. Let's continue our lecture uh, on chapter two, the Renaissance. So today we're gonna be talking about the Northern Renaissance, which is really, um, a, we're gonna see the Italian Renaissance start to spread to different areas of Europe, and we're gonna kind of see an evolution of some of those ideals that in the Italian Renaissance uh, manifest themselves in the form of this Northern Renaissance. And this Northern Renaissance is gonna be taking place um, in uh, some of the you know Northern Germanic lands, um, the Low Countries, Belgium, uh, modern-day Belgium and Netherlands, okay? Um, and so it, it, we're going to see some of these ideals of the Italian Renaissance spread elsewhere throughout Europe, okay? And, this, and it's going to form this movement called the, um, the Northern Renaissance. All right? Um, when, as we talk about the Northern Renaissance, ladies and gentlemen, what I want you all to think about is the Northern Renaissance in the context of the Protestant Reformation. Now, you all might be saying, Harv, dude, we haven't even talked about the Protestant Reformation yet, and... I know that, all right? The Protestant Reformation is, is going to be in our next chapter, and we're, we're getting there. But the Northern Renaissance has to, a lot to do with why the Protestant Reformation goes down. So I want you to be thinking about the Northern Renaissance in that it's going to be a key reason, a key cause for the Protestant Reformation for Martin Luther all right, in his 95 Theses, all right? So just let's let's think about it in the context of like the of how it, it's going to impact the future. It, it's, it's going to be a, a key cause for why the Reformation um uh, goes down okay um so what we're gonna see is a lot of the ideals of the italian renaissance ideals like truth um reason critical analysis uh, logic are gonna start spreading to northern europe and really we're gonna see you know northern europeans take some of these ideals from the italian renaissance and kind of make them their own the northern renaissance is really going to be focused on finding the truth not necessarily of the greeks and romans like the italian renaissance but Northern Renaissance, we're going to see humanists really trying to find the truth of religion. And that's going to be really important for the Protestant Reformation. Okay? These ideas of the Italian Renaissance are going to spread elsewhere throughout Europe because of a brand new invention that we have to know. I cannot emphasize this enough. Get out a highlighter, highlight this, put it in your notes, circle it, star it. We've got to know this. The printing press. The printing press is a game changer. Um, people, it's going to help increase literacy because books are going to be widely available. Ideas are going to spread quickly. People are going to start. Uh, academia is going to take, go, you know, go on another level. It, communication is going to increase. It, it is going to lead to our print culture of the Enlightenment, our reading culture that we're going to see in the 1800s. The, the printing press is a game changer for ideas, for communication. And, and for the spread of culture, for the, for the spread of ideas, okay? So it's, it's super vital for us, okay? Super vital for us. We have to know this invention, all right? It is invented by a man named Gutenberg, all right? Um, and it, one of the key effects of the, uh, of the printing press, ladies and gentlemen, that we have to know is that it is going to lead to a huge increase in literacy, specifically lay literacy. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's going to be a large increase in the literacy for people who are not associated with the Catholic Church or, you know, the clergy. All right. This is for mainly non-religious associated individuals. Now, why is that important? You're going to start seeing these individuals reading books, religious books, such as the Bible for the first time. And there might be some discrepancies between what they've been told by the Catholic Church and what they're reading. And so, you know, a great example is going to be the Pope. Many people are going to start reading the Bible for the first time and notice that there is no Pope mentioned in the Bible at all. And so they might question, should we follow the Pope at all? Because he's not mentioned in the Bible. You know, another, another, and this is something that Martin Luther is going to seize on. Martin Luther will be influenced by this. Okay, so this is going to be really influential for Protestantism because many people are going to start, you know, reading the Bible for themselves. All right. Um, another key factor in why the printing press uh, and uh, literature and books are going to be so widely available and why the printing press is thus going to be so in impactful and important is because we're going to see the development of a new cheap paper. If paper is cheap, that means that it's a lot cheaper to print books. And if it's cheap, then it's, uh, they're able to, uh, more people are able to purchase them. Okay, so that's going to be really important. All right? um, it replaces vellum, which was sheepskin and calfskin. Uh, uh, which is more expensive, all right? So we're going to start to see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the printing press, 
lead to a greater, um, you know, abundance of books available. All right, and people are in there. It's going to be cheap, and people are going to start being able to read and learn how to read, and uh, you know, read some important text for the first time. All right, uh, the first book, like like I mentioned, uh, a lot of of the uh, first books uh, printed are religious books. Remember, we're we're in a very religiously centered society uh, during this time. Uh, Christianity is super important. Catholicism is still very important. So the first book that's going to be printed is going to be the Bible and a lot of other religious texts. Okay, but this is really important because many people are going to be reading the Bible for the first time. And there's no coincidence that, you know, within the next uh, uh, couple decades that the Protestant Reformation will start. because many people are going to be reading some of these ideas and have new ideas when it comes to religion. All right. Uh, so by 1500, there's going to be 40,000 uh, titles published. By 1500, there's going to be numerous uh, printing presses around Europe. Now, we're going to see printing presses mainly in Western and Central Europe, not necessarily Eastern Europe. Keep that in our back pocket. We're going to need to talk about that, especially when it comes to the Russians, all right, which we're going to get into in a couple chapters, all right? Mostly religious books are going to be printed. The classics, right, humanism is still really important. We're going to see Latin and Greek classics printed, but the, the, the effects, the results are super important. Scholarly research, critical analysis is going to go through the roof, all right? Public access to learning um, uh, is, going to be, is going to be much more widely available. People are going to be able to read, be, uh, be able to uh, you know, learn some of these new ideas, all right? And so there's going to be, uh, you know, the everyday average people, there's going to be a lot, there's going to be greater opportunities for them to, uh, you know, to, to, to learn how to read and to start reading. All right, and the spread of ideas. All right, you're going to see it, with books being able to be published so quickly and uh, you know very cheaply. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's going to help spread ideas. People are going to be able to get their hands on books and ideas. Really important for us. All right, so let's talk about some of the main key components of the Northern Renaissance. Okay, so many of the ideas from Italy are going to spread north. All right, however, we're going to see the Northern Renaissance kind of have its own theme. All right. And the Northern Renaissance is going to be centered on religion, specifically religious reform, right? No coincidence that the Northern Renaissance is going to facilitate our Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation is a religious movement, right? And so what I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is that the, the, the Northern Renaissance humanists like Erasmus, who we're going to talk about right now, all right, are going to take a lot of the ideals from the Greeks and Romans, like those ideas of truth critical analysis and they're going to apply them to religion aka we're going to see the northern renaissance be considered christian humanist and they're trying to find the truth of religion the truth of religion all right they're gonna they're gonna they're still very good christians but you know they're kind of looking at the catholic church and being like you know we're gonna read the bible we're gonna read some of these uh christian texts for ourselves y'all don't need to tell us what they're all about and you know the importance of them we're gonna read them for ourselves and try to find the truth of them that's really important, ladies and gentlemen, and going to be a key reason of why we're going to start seeing different ideas when it comes to religion within the Protestant Reformation. So they are taking those, the Northern humanists are taking those ideals of the Greeks and Romans, that critical analysis, that truth, and they're applying it to religion. Okay, we are seeing the scholars of the Northern Renaissance try to take reason and bridge it to religion. Okay, find the truth of religion. Really important. Okay, uh, a contrast with the Italian Renaissance that the Northern Renaissance was more inclusive. It, you know, you have more everyday average people are going to be able to participate within this. It's not just for what the wealthy individuals, uh, merchants, the papacy, like we saw in the, uh, the Italian Renaissance, much more inclusive movement. Okay, more people from different socioeconomic backgrounds are going to be able to participate within this. Okay, we're going to see a different emphasis. Okay. Uh, they're not really uh, in the Italian Renaissance. Remember, they were they were obsessed with the Greeks and Romans and those texts. Okay, um, we're going to see the Northern Renaissance humanists take a lot of those Greek and Roman ideals, but they're not necessarily going to apply them to Greek and Roman texts. They're going to take those ideals of truth and critical analysis from the Greeks and Romans, but apply them to early Christian writings. They're going to look for the earliest versions of the Bible and see if there's a pope in them, and they're going to find out that there isn't. All right, so th th that's what they're looking at. They're going to be looking at ancient Christian writings, texts, and they're looking to find the truth of religion, okay? Because there's so much discontent with the Catholic Church. They're saying, is there another different version of, of 
Christianity that we don't know about that they're not telling us. Okay? Um, so yeah, they're, they're reading the earliest versions, Greek and Hebrew versions of the Bible to find the truth of the Bible, to find the truth of uh, church practices. Okay? And they're simply trying to find out um, if there are things, you know, that they don't know when it comes to religion. They're trying to find the truth of religion on their own without other people telling them what religion is supposed to look like or be like. Okay, very important. All right, some are even going to start to question, okay, the Bible, which will, and what we're, we're going to get at is the Protestant Reformation, but eventually science, okay, and the scientific revolution, okay, where some people outright, you know, question certain parts of the Bible, which is going to be very, very uh, impactful. Okay, so religious reform, all right, finding the truth of religion, that's a main theme of the Northern Renaissance, okay? Um, this is just a quick chart. I'm not going to go through all of it, okay? But really important for us to uh, kind of look at some of the differences and similarities between the, the two different Renaissances. You know, for example, uh, in Italy, it was much more based on, uh, you know, the wealthy, the affluent, while in the Northern Renaissance, um, you know, you had more um, rule, you're going to have lower socioeconomic classes participate, all right? The Italian Renaissance was much more secular. It wasn't really uh, motivated for or really didn't involve religion too much, okay? Um, so, 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 so some clear uh, similarities and differences, okay, between the two. All right, here we go. Let's move on. All right, very important humanist. Going to need to know him for your AP exam. Going to need to know him for my exam. All right, this is Mr. Desdarius Erasmus. He is the prince of the humanists, the leading Christian humanist, and he is going to, this, as the saying goes, and I want to uh, kind of want to memorize this saying, he is going to lay the egg that Martin Luther will hatch within the Protestant Reformation. He is going to be the key, one of the key influences to Mr. Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Now, Erasmus himself is a good Catholic. Okay, he was a devout Catholic. He didn't. He didn't. He is not going to believe in Protestantism, and he will not leave the Catholic Church. Okay, All right, but what he did was he sought church reform. He saw a lot of hypocrisy within the church, a lot of corruption with the church, a lot of he had a lot of problems with the church, and he is going to look at you know the truth and try to find the truth of religion. Try to see if some of these church practices, some of these things that the church, the Catholic Church is saying for Christians to do, to see if, you know, where they come from. He's going to try to find the truth of religion, all right? Uh, he was a master of the Greek language, okay? He's definitely very much a, a humanist, all right? And his book that we need to know is uh, is called Praise of Folly. And he is going to criticize the hypocrisy of the church. And we're going to get into some of those hypocrisies a little bit later. But there are some certain things that the church is, you know, saying, but they're not following. Okay, and he's going to look and he's going to kind of look at different texts and be like, hey, where did these things come from? What's going on with y'all? All right, and he's going to call them out. Okay, and he is going to inspire Martin Luther to take it a step further and come up with a different denomination of religion, right, which will be Lutheranism. Okay, so Erasmus is going to be is, is our most important humanist and his text, Praise of Folly, is going to be really influential for Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. But important for us to remember, he is a Catholic. He does not become a Protestant. He's merely going to influence the movement of the Protestant Reformation. Okay? He does not join them. All right? All right, this is Sir Thomas More. Um, he is uh, another uh, humanist that we need to talk about. Um, he, he studied uh, law. And he's going to be really important for the English Reformation. Now, he um, he was actually best friends with Henry VIII. We talked, I mentioned uh, in our previous lecture about Henry Tudor, Henry VII, um, you know, that he was he helped build that Tudor dynasty. Henry VIII was um, uh, Henry Tudor's son. And Sir Thomas More was best friends with Henry VIII. Um, now, uh, what, what we need to know, ladies and gentlemen, about Sir Thomas More uh, is that he helps introduce humanism to England, okay? And actually, Sir Thomas More uh, was a, a, a good a good Catholic, okay? He was actually best he was best friends with Henry VIII, and Henry VIII actually, when he creates the English Church during the English Reformation, which we'll get to, all right, he's actually gonna he's actually gonna kill Sir Thomas More, and have him executed, all right? They 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 were best friends. They even they used to watch stars together. Man, kind of crazy. All right, uh, but Sir Thomas More, another important humanist for us, okay? Um, and he's actually going to write 
um, Henry VIII's opposition to Martin Luther. Sir Thomas More was a good Catholic, okay, and he, but he but he's going to disagree when Henry VIII tries to create the Anglican, uh, the Church of England. He, they're going to have a big disagreement. Sir Thomas More does not want to do that, and Henry VIII he wants his divorce. He's going to want to do that. Uh, is going to be like, all right, well, we're not friends anymore, and he's going to kill him, which is kind of gnarly. All right, here we go. Let's move on. All right, yeah, like I like I said, he's going to break with Henry VIII in the matter of his annulment, and he's going to be executed. All right. All right, another important humanist, okay, that we'll see in in um, in England will be William Shakespeare. I'm sure many of us are familiar with that, and a lot of his writing will reflect the classic Greeks and Romans, uh, and there will be lots of humanism within his writing. All right, and uh, the last humanist um, that we'll kind of talk about is uh, Miguel de Cervantes, okay, and he wrote Don Quixote. It's a, a great masterpiece of Spanish literature, and Miguel uh, de Cervantes was really critical of Spain in this text. He was very critical of religious idealism. And um, if you all know the story of uh, Don Quixote, it was about this knight who's kind of, who's considered crazy and he's off saving people. And th this is really, uh, 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 Miguel de Cervantes was, was really kind of making fun of Spain um, because Spain is unwilling to change. It, it, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later um, and talk more about that. But uh, Don, uh, you know, Miguel de Cervantes, what he's, what he, what he is uh, really commenting on is Spain's unwillingness to change, and that's going to be their undoing. Their, their, their attachment. They're, they're not open to new ideas. Or they're Catholic. They're not open to Protestants. They're not open to any other dominations. And that, 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 that unwillingness to change and accept others. In that unwillingness. Um, you know, to move forward. Okay, or accept new ideas is really going to be their downfall. Okay, they're unwilling to change. They're not accepted to new ideas. So we're going to see some of the Protestant countries who are open to new ideas, open to others, flourish like the Netherlands, like England. And we're going to see Spain. It's going to reach its apex, but it's going to really, it's going to uh, fall pretty quickly. And part of that reason that Miguel de Cervantes is talking about is they're not open to new ideas. They're not going to be open to science. Okay, they're not going to be open to some of the agricultural, industrial. Uh, they're, they're, they want to focus on the old, feudal Catholic ways and their un their unwillingness to change is going to be their downfall and we'll, we'll, we'll get there and talk about that okay all right ladies and gentlemen that's it for today thank you so much okay uh, we'll stop here and the next lecture will be about the art of the northern renaissance thank you so much